Well, hello everybody and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta and this is Consistent Preterism. Thank you for joining me today. Today I am cruising to work with a sheet of ice over the windshield with a hole about two inches by two inches wide. And I'm looking through it like Ace Ventura Pet Detective trying not to crash into anyone. And um, just a real, real safe way to drive. No, I'm kidding. Well, kind of. I got a little bit more than a two by two inch. I might have a 12 by 12 inch. Uh, space to look through, but um, yeah, man, this sheet of ice is brutal. Living in the frozen tundra. Anyways, folks, I just wanted to yap a little bit, and get on the old horn and blap a little bit, and uh, talk about a few things. <clears throat> but before I did that, I wanted to bring forth a little story. Um, there is a dentist that I am friends with. He's a customer of mine, of mine, and. Uh, He's, uh, I think he's from Chicago is where his practice is. Um, he's actually got a couple practices. But anyways, he's a customer of mine. And uh, somehow we ended up, you know, obviously linked up on uh, LinkedIn. Go figure. And so, you know, whatever. So he posts things and whatnot. So I was able to see that recently. <clears throat> oh, mind you, a little backstory. This guy's a very devout Christian. Totally sold out for Jesus. Um, like in, in that kind of like, you know crazy way too and so uh he he's got a very successful practice you know and all those things and he gives all the glory to god for it, all the glory to jesus for it and you know and i just think that's cool you know and uh, I, but i wonder about you know all the poverty stricken people with no food who also believe in jesus um who have barely enough money to put clothes on their backs you know like what what about them like god only seems to help out a chosen few um but recently, this guy shared a post that explained a uh, turbulent, violent injury that he sustained. Um, and this was weeks back, so I can't exactly remember how. Um, I almost want to say that he might have been at like a, an amusement park or something, and some and somehow something hit him in the eye while he was on a roller coaster or something like that. That's what's coming to my memory. But he had this violent eye injury where he literally was blind for a short time and then his sight started to come back but it hasn't healed correctly and so he's left with like you know very very blurry vision in one eye and it's kind of like thrown him for a loop and his you know his dentistry has been on hold for two months and blah 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 so anyways he puts this uh this post up today or yesterday about how uh, god always comes through and how you know, he, he hasn't been able to work and, you know, it's been very tough for him financially. And I'm thinking to myself, good grief. Like this guy probably makes, you know, 450 K a year. He's an endodontist. So he, uh, he makes more than just a general dentist. He's a specialty, um, uh, dentist. So anyways, he puts up this post about how, you know, it's been tough and blah, blah, blah. And so, <clears throat> and that may be true, but anyways, this post about it being tough was all centered around the fact that somebody sent him a letter in the mail and in the letter they quoted Jeremiah 29 where it says I know the plans I have for you plans to not harm you <laughs> but to prosper you and give you a future and a hope or something along those lines I just paraphrased it but you know and he was just glorifying God about how this passage came through at the timely at a <clears throat> timely point and it really gave him you know strength and all this stuff and I'm thinking to myself how delusional can someone be to, first of all, that passage has nothing to do with anyone today. That passage was all about the Israelites and, and how God uh, had plans for them. That was a, there was a context to that passage. You can't just rip that out of the context and say that it applies to you as an endodontist, right? That, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but what's even a little bit more uh, interesting is that the passage actually says that I have, I will not harm you and I have plans to prosper you and give you a future. Well, that's the very thing that happened to this guy. This guy was violently harmed. This guy was brutally taking something straight to the eyeball that has now put him out of commission. All right, I mean, talk about n n my plans are not to harm you. I mean, could that be any more of a polar opposite with this guy taking something straight to the eyeball? Almost causing him to go blind, pretty much. I mean, uh, yeah, that's kind of it. Um, plans to prosper you and give you a future and a hope. I mean, this eye injury is so far from what that passage says. It's not even funny. Yet somehow 
he's been able to turn it around and apply that passage to this situation. But that's just the whole point. You know, like Christians, for the most part, can take any passage they want and they can make it say whatever the heck they want it to say. So the Bible is, is no longer a book that can be read with logic, intelligence, and common sense. It's just a book that you just throw passages around and stick them wherever they stick. And so when I stopped doing that, personally, is when things started to make sense. And I realized that the story didn't pertain to us one bit. But enough about that. What I want to yap about today <clears throat> is a little bit of what I've been yapping about the last couple of days. Uh, with the Genesis stuff with Abraham. And what I've shown in the last couple of days is that the uh, promise, right? Well, we'll start with the um, all families of the earth will be blessed through you or uh, all families of the earth will be blessed through, through Abraham, right? That passage. Well, I showed that in its context, that passage is simply talking about the families of the land, all right? The ones who were going to be blessed were the ones who were going to inherit the land. And that word earth is a very deceiving word because people look at it and think it means entire planet when in the context all that was being said there was that those who inherit that land of Canaan the word is uh, uh, Adama A-D-A-M-E-H all that inherit that land territory region earth were going to be blessed and the whole context was on Canaan so there's nothing universal about that at all and when you look through those Pass those passages and chapters of Genesis, like Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 22, and you see what's actually being said there, it would take a real <clears throat> butchering of Scripture to think that it was saying anything other than literal descendants, or that it was talking about anything other than literal descendants, right? Because this is where the promise begins. We have to look here, because this is a very important part of Scripture. Let's go to Genesis 22, verse 15, and read about this promise. Now, this is right after God had spared Isaac by throwing a ram in the thicket. And so the Lord, it says, Then the Lord, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Okay, hang on. Uh, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Okay, so God is telling Abraham, good job, well done, you listened, you were about to slaughter your own son, what a nice God, um, and he says, because of that, I'm going to bless you, and the blessing is highly focused on his descendants from there, he says, blessing, I will bless you, multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies, now, <clears throat> if you know anything about Israel's uh, history and what's recorded in Israel's history, you know that they are the ones who fulfill this promise to be multiplied like the sand on the seashore. Look at Deuteronomy 1 verses 9 and 10. Moses is standing before the Israelites roughly 400 years after Abraham, after this promise was made, and he looks out at them and he says, Israel, here you are today as the stars of heaven in number. You are too great for me to, to, to count or to bear. So, remember, God promised Abraham that his descendants would become like the stars of heaven in number. And then 400 years later, we get to Moses, and Moses is telling the Israelites that they had become like the stars of heaven in number. So, do you see how Abraham's descendants in Genesis 22 is the Israelites? Because they are the ones whom the story says fulfills that promise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Likewise, in 1 Chronicles 27, I believe it is, David is taking a census. He's counting the, the people of Israel for war. And it says flat out in the text that David did not count the children of Israel who were under 20 years of age because the Lord had promised to multiply them like the stars of heaven in number. Well, again, drawing back from the promise to Abraham that his descendants would become like the stars of heaven in number, David doesn't count the children under 20 years old because David knew of the promise. David, David was well aware that there was a promise that God was going to multiply them, so he didn't want to nip that or snip that and cut it short by sending off 
young ones to war. So it's all, and that's just two, right? There's dozens. It's all over the Old Testament. We see this promise fulfilled by the Israelites. So the story is desperately hoping that the reader understands that the ones who fulfilled the promise to Abraham, a.k.a. Abraham's descendants or Abraham's seed, was the Israelites. It's just crying out, saying, I'm giving you the clues. I'm giving you all the answers. These are the ones who fulfilled that promise. These are Abraham's seed. These are Abraham's descendants. And yet people still cannot see it because nobody studies. Nobody reads the Old Testament. And the ones who do, they're very, very biased and they think it's all about them. So they can't see this stuff. But it's plain as day. Then he goes on, he says in uh, Genesis 22, and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. Well, that's the whole point with Israel, folks. Everything we see in the Old Testament with Israel is about them possessing the gates of their enemies. Israel just moves in on lands and takes over territories and slaughters people left and right. That's the whole point. God was going to bless them and curse others. He was going to look out for them. He was going to make nations bow down before them. He would give them their territories and lands, okay? That's the whole point. It's all over the Old Testament, and it's always about his chosen ones, Israel. So who do you think this is when it's talking about descendants? The word used for descendants twice here in Genesis 22 is Zera, Z-E-R-A. And its literal definition is offspring, descendant, posterity, children. Sometimes it's even used for semen. So what do you really think this means, folks? Is it spiritual? No. It's not at all. And look what the next verse says. So this uh, author of Genesis uses the word descendants, Zera. Well, I'm sorry, he uses Zera twice there. And our translation translates it as descendants, right? But then somehow in verse 18, that same word is used, Zera, by the author. But our translation translates it as seed. I wonder why that is. All right, I mean, maybe they just thought it sounded better, but it should still be descendants. There's no difference. It's the same word. Verse 18 of Genesis 22 says, he goes on after he's saying, <clears throat> um, and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed, Zeta, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So again, in your descendants, all the nations of the land or all the people of the land, because again, that word is goy, all right, and it's either nations, people, tribes. So that word, nations, is probably not the best word that could have been used there. But in your descendants, all the people of the land shall be blessed. Okay, all the people of the land shall be blessed. Not earth, not globe, not planet. Okay, and not spiritual seed, but in your descendants. Zeta, same, same word. And if we look through the other portions of Genesis, we see the exact same thing that every time this nation promise, or every time the word nations comes up about them being blessed or having anything to do with the nations, it's always tied to Abraham's descendants, always. So in his descendants, the nations would be blessed or the peoples would be blessed, right? Because the whole story is focused on Abraham's descendants, okay? And when you understand that, and when you come to the New Testament writings of Paul, Specifically, when he, when he refers to Abraham, you can see so very clearly what he's doing. For instance, Romans 4, like I mentioned the other day, when, when he's going through the motions in Romans 4 saying, what did our father Abraham find according to his circumcision? Nothing. It was his faith, right? But he's going through and he, and he quotes that promise to these you know, so-called pagans, right? Everybody would think the, the saints in Rome are just foreigners. But he says, he tells them, he says, he quotes the, the promise to Abraham that in your descendants or your descendants would be blessed. So he's quoting that promise, letting these ones in Rome know that they are the descendants of Abraham, which is why he starts off chapter four by saying, what did our, our father Abraham find according to the law or to the circumcision? But I wanted to, there, there's so much more I can get into on this and how it ties in with the New Testament. But I want to read uh, Galatians chapter four verse uh, 21 and forward, because here Paul is talking about the two covenants. Paul starts off, he says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. So he goes back to Abraham again. <clears throat> he says the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. Well, okay. So first of all, we can see already the contrast between the uh, bondwoman and the free woman, right? The law 
those the children of the law and the children of promise. All right. So this little kind of contrast between the law and the promise um, goes all the way through Paul's letters. We see it everywhere. Like for instance, Romans four uh, sixteen, where he says, "For the promise." to Abraham that he would be heir of the world was not to him or to his seed through the law, but it was him, it was to him and through his seed through faith. So, um, you can see over and over again, how Paul kind of contrasts those two things, the law versus faith, right? But notice it doesn't extend outside of the seed, right? It, It wasn't to Abraham and to his seed through the law, but it was to Abraham and to his seed through faith. So it wasn't the ones of law or the, the ones who relied on the law, that were of the seed. It was the ones who relied on faith of the seed that were the children, right? So it doesn't go outside of the seed. It's just to the seed through faith, all right? So when Paul's going through this two covenant thing, he talks about the two sons. He says the one son by a bond woman, the other by a free woman. So there's the law verse faith again. Then he goes on in verse 23. He says, but he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh, Well, again, that's the law, folks. That's the flesh of the circumcision, right? Paul is always trying to tell them, like, the circumcision means nothing, right? It's about faith, right? Your father, Abraham, even before he was circumcised, he was counted righteous because of his faith, right? So he's trying to get this little point across here that the, uh, according to the flesh, meaning according to the flesh of the foreskin, the law, the covenant circumcision commandment, um, that means nothing, right? He says, but he who was born of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he who was born of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, okay? So he defines these two things, right? The two covenants. He says, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. So what is Paul saying there? Well, this this particular portion rules out all ideas that people are under the biblical curse today. It really does. It rules out any chance that any of us were ever part and you know partakers of this biblical curse. Because Paul is basically saying that the bondage that's in focus in the story is directly related to the law, to Jerusalem, and to those tied to that system. Okay, very clear, right? The ones who are in bondage, right? Everybody likes to say today, oh, all the world is in bondage and uh, everybody's in bondage if they don't know Jesus. And, you know, because that's just what they've been trained to say. They don't know what they're saying, so they just say whatever they've been trained to say. Right? And then they go through the typical explanation when you question them and, br- and bring it to their attention why that's wrong. But it's not making any sense. Because Paul is very clear that the ones who are in bondage, the ones who are under the curse, were those under the law. He says it in Galatians 3, one chapter prior. And here he ties the bondage designation and the curse and everything to those of the flesh who were in Jerusalem. Those of the law. Okay. Then he goes on and... He uh, quotes an Old Testament passage, and then in verse 28, he says, Now we brethren, as Isaac was, now that's interesting, now we brethren, right? He's calling them brothers, they're, they're actually descendants of Israel. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Right? Remember now, it's not, to, it's not to Abraham's seed through the law, it's to Abraham's seed through faith. So this is Abraham's seed, but those of faith. He's writing to the saints. Then he goes on, he says, But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Again, what is he talking about? He's talking about the persecution that the Jews, the law abiding or law, you know, worshiping Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ones who were persecuting them, the Satan of the story, the ones who were following them around, roaming like a lion, looking to devour them, the one that Jesus said would hate them because it hated him first, the world, the one who would persecute them, right? The ones in throughout the whole New Testament who are persecuting the saints, Paul refers to them here, and he says, but as he who was born according to the law then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. And we see that kind of thing right from the start. We see Cain and Abel, 
All right, we see Cain trying to, you know, abide by the law, you know, and, and or, you know, Abel showing his faith, Cain killing him. We see Ishmael and Isaac. And we, we go forward and we see these kinds of things. And even so, at the very end, we see that the ones who are of the law, the serpents, the brood of vipers, as Jesus called them, they are persecuting the saints, right? So that makes very, very good sense. Verse 30 says, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Then he quotes it. He says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So what he's saying is he's pulling back from Romans 4 or 3, whatever one it is. I think it's 4, where Paul says that the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. It was to his seed through faith. He's pulling from that. He's saying the same exact thing to a different body of believers here in Galatia. Bear with me one moment, trying to make a dangerous and deadly turn. Maybe not dangerous and deadly, but... Go ahead, buddy. Do the Portuguese pull out. There you go. Block off traffic. All right, and we're off. <clears throat> so, again, this little portion here in Galatians 4 is pretty telling because it shows exactly who was... In focus, when the Bible talks of the curse and of bondage, Galatians 3 and Galatians 4 say it flat out. The curse and the bondage of this story is all related to those who are under the law. Okay? No getting around that. That was never you or I. All right? And then, of course, we see more of that same comparison of, of Paul where he talks about the ones that he's writing to, are the they are the children of promise. They are the seed of faith. All right? They are the descendants... Going back to Genesis, because remember, in his descendants, many nations would be blessed. So the whole point here is Paul's gathering in Abraham's descendants. He's gathering in these ones from all places where they were. All right. And these were the ones of faith. And he's trying to, you know, basically tell them like, hey, the law isn't important here. Your father was justified before he ever snipped his wiener. Faith is what's important. But again, folks, not outside of the confines and parameters of the narrative, meaning not outside of the seed, not outside of the descendants. So anyways, folks, hopefully that wasn't too much rambling. Hopefully you followed my train of thought there. Um, it's very easy to see that Paul was going around gathering in the descendants of Abraham because once we understand the start of the story and we establish that fact, and what was taking place there and the promises that God was making to Abraham and how they were literally all about his descendants, then we can see exactly why Paul is referring back to that promise as he's writing to these individuals at the end, referring back to the promise that God made about Abraham's descendants. And the reason is, is because he is writing to literal descendants of Abraham. Anyways, folks, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like. If you didn't, Take a you-know-what. We'll see you on that flip side. Bye-bye.